today we're going to do an antiques road show. <laughs> and I think that um, how this started was years ago I was, um, uh, I was working on my doctorate and I was actually known to be a pretty good researcher. And so the Antiques Roadshow in Boston had me come up and I was researching behind the scenes. And there was one close up of uh, the appraisers that all come and I was in the back frantically researching an object and some very enterprising young lady from a financial house called Eaton Vance. She called me, they're based in Boston, she called me and she said, would you do a private road show for our million dollar investors? And this was over 15 years ago. So now, uh, at the time I needed the money and I would charge for that, but now I do that for people that I care about and organizations I care about. When we are going to talk about your things, I'm going to use replacement cost. Why? Because it's higher, generally, always higher than fair market value. It's what you would buy things for in the manner of which you purchase, so gallery price, as opposed to auction price, if that makes sense. So we're going to use the higher value when we look at your objects. Let's talk a little bit about the history of dinnerware. So if we go back to the 14th century, and we go back to very early dinnerware. We had two materials to make dinnerware out of. One was wood, the other was pewter. Do you know the, um, the expression in the trenches or to the trencher? It's literally a trench of wood and people would put the meal in the trench and people would eat from the same trench, from the trench of wood. Well, the higher class people commissioned a plate of pewter. And this happened primarily in the Low Countries, in Europe, and also France is known for its pewter, to be honest. This is actually Germanic, and of course Germany wasn't un united until 1848. So we don't know what part of Germany. The double eagle points in, I think, a direction towards Upper Saxon Germany, so closer to the Prussian border now, today. So when we say, I have a plate. Literally all your life you had a plate. And you only had one utensil. The utensil was kind of a knife shaped thing. And you had a little, if you visited a family, you had a little leather pouch. You'd put your knife in your pouch and you would scoop up with the knife, you would cut with the knife, you would eat with the knife. And the plate, you will notice it is engraved with the gentleman's name. That's because that was his plate, period. That was all he had. There was no table settings. Then I think your question is, well, that's fine, but what about the china? Okay, let's think about it. We did not know the chemical composition of china until the 18th century. We did in China, we did in Persia, they did, but they guarded that secret. And we did not have the chemical composition for porcelain. We had other types of ceramic. You know, we had terracotta, we had ironstone, we had stoneware, salt glaze. We had all the kinds of porcelain you would associate with the late medieval period, but we didn't have fine porcelain china. My prediction is if you have children who are 30 years old, you will not have fine porcelain china going into the future because your kids do not want it. And it is worth so little on the market today because the market doesn't want it. People will always come up to me after an event like this and say, yes, but what about my China? No China is... <laughs> so the value of the pewter, actually that's a really nice piece and it is 18th century. We looked at the hallmarks. It is authentic. When you look at pewter, sometimes you'll see uh, that it is reproduction or sometimes it's, what is that stuff? It's, not, it's pewter and tin together. My mother used to have it. So, so it's, a, it's a composition now. The question is, can you eat off of pewter safely? And the answer is, can you, John? No. Okay. <laughs> it's lead. Yes, it's my great more organic camps. So the value of the plate, you know, I put 300 to $400 on that. So what, what's next feature? Oh, okay. So you will look at this and you'll say right away, oh, Elizabeth, it's Tiffany. Right? It has that look. It has that Lewis Comfort Tiffany look. Now, let's talk about copyright. Because when we talk about copyright, there's a P 
period of time in which the United States decided that things could be copyrighted. And does anyone know the date when we started to think about copyright? Well, it was right at the, at the first quarter of the 20th century. And up to that time, if you made something and the public liked it, well, you could copy such a thing. And so, although this, they look like Tiffany, I don't see any Tiffany mark. And Via and I just both agreed that Tiffany has a, how can I explain this? This is why I think it's so difficult to buy things online, because you can't feel the weight. You can't smell the bronze. They should be bronze if they're Tiffany. They should have a weight to them if they're Tiffany. The slag glass should be a little more subtle if they're Tiffany. They could be Tiffany, but I doubt it. And I think they're a Tiffany knockoff. Um, they're just too lightweight, but they have a great look. What is the look called? Art Nouveau. Art Nouveau. And then some people will say arts and crafts. That's another mm -hmm. definition. And you know, we're talking about the first quarter of the 20th century when things like this were happening. And it's interesting because all the things that happen in Art Nouveau as a period in American cultural history happens first in metalware. It's a very unique time. It happens first in jewelry, in things like this. It's always breaking through in the metalware. In, and that's because, well, I don't want to insult John, our photographer. That's because so many women were being trained in metalwork. And all the great copper artists and metal artists at the first quarter of the 20th century were all women. And they did beautiful, beautiful metal work. You know, Tiffany and some of the arts and crafts studios employed women to do the metal work. So this is Tiffany's style. I will say that there's some what we call losses. So the slag glass is damaged. So, you know, we would be putting these around $400 the pair. So right now we know that we're right that it's not Tiffany because Seth Thomas did not make for Tiffany. Mm -hmm. Now, Tiffany didn't always mark their clocks Tiffany, by the way. There were other jewelers making their clocks, but somehow Seth Thomas wasn't one of them. So yeah, this was what we call that. Oh, what's the, what's the name for a set of things that goes on the mantle? I don't know. <laughs> Metal piece. What's the name when you get a fancy dinner and there's a piece of parsley? Garnish. Garnish. Mantle garnish. That's what it's called. It's a mantle garnish. So the clock and the candlesticks are the mantle garnish. Or garni, I guess, is the plural, isn't it? So what we have always on the mantelpiece is really interesting metaphor. Because if you study, like I do, I study material culture and the symbolism of material culture. It's the center of the house. There are two things at the center of the house that is represented by the clock and the candlesticks. What are they? Now, time, and time, and, time and heat and light. Yeah. Illumination and time. And that is usually the mantelpiece. And people always assume that it never was any different, but it starts from a philosophy, mm. a psychology, that at the center of the house there's light and, and, uh, and heat and time all anatomically correct this little this little figure and so you see um, some people will look at it and say oh it's a doctor's model well it's not so there were Chinese doctors models. this is Japanese the Chinese doctors models were used always female and it had all the uh, things that we all have except for John and um, and you went into the doctor's office and you pointed to the areas that you couldn't mention or couldn't show the doctor, right? But that isn't the case with Japanese Netskis. With this, it was meant to wear as a toggle for a little bit of titillation on a man's obi. So, so here's the obi sash, and then hanging from the obi, he had maybe a couple of Netskis. He had maybe a little pouch for his paints and his calligraphy material. You know, they carried things off the obi, and the Netski was the, the head toggle. It kind of brought it all together. And it was part of the Netsky culture that they be slightly erotic. Mm -hmm. And so you find this slight erotic, you know, um, motif in some of the net Netsky. Now, I'm amongst friends here and I know I can tell you we are not allowed to buy or sell ivory 
and I think for a good reason. A lot of people have a problem with it that collect ivory because it, it, there's no market value. If you can't buy or sell ivory, there's no market value. So uh, it goes to the extent of people saying to me, well, you know, I want to sell this rare musical instrument. Many musical instruments have ivory pieces. If you want to take your Beckstein, let's say you're a concert pianist and you want to take your Beckstein to another state, even that's a problem because you're crossing state lines with ivory. So it's become fairly draconian, but I think for a good reason. Now, it won't surprise you to know that this administration is trying to change that. <laughs> So uh, anyway, so now uh, here's the question, if, yeah, yeah, the issue is how much would it have been worth previous to 2011 when the ban was in force, and you see that would have been worth 800 to 1,000, but now since it is something that I can't even tell you the value now, you see it's illegal for me to communicate that it has the value. Now does anyone happen to know? Uh, the original maker of this bag, does anyone know, b besides the owner, does anyone happen to know what it is? Native American? Yes! It's, very good. it's Native yeah. American, yeah. yeah. So it's a Native American bag. I see a lot of these that people don't know they're Native American. Well, I haven't seen many lately, but you see occasionally when you go to, um, what do you call it, thrift stores or bazaars, such a thing, you know, someone will say, oh, that's like a hippie creation from the 60s. No, no, no. This is a Native American bag, and it was not used by a female. It was worn by a brave, and I would say it would be Cree or Crow, because the Cree or Crow designs, they had that beautiful floral design, etc. The beads are right. What I mean by that is the beads are not mechanically made, they're hand poured, etc. It's a beautiful piece. Um, we had the honor to do the appraisal for 160,000 objects of the late Jonathan Winters and he had Cree blood. He had, so he had some beautiful cream material. So I got to see the best of the best in Mr. Winter's collection. So the value of such a thing, it's in such perfect condition. You know, we're talking two to 3,000 on such a thing. Yeah, so it is a absolutely beautiful thing. Now, they, people always say to me, well, how do I curate such a thing? How do I make it so it lasts? Because why I think this is important is because Native American material it's over, more or less. I mean, you have beautiful Native American artisans, but Native American material goes in three stages. It goes for the tribe, for the trading post, and then it becomes a little diluted with our Western ideas of beauty, and all of a sudden it loses its abstraction, and it really loses its, its purity. So we won't see this again. So it's important to, to keep it in good condition. You know, perhaps in museum paper, perhaps never, ever in plastic, no baggies, no dry cleaning bags. I think that's first quarter 20th century. I mean, and you know, Native American material, that's probably tending to the end of the, remember I told you there's three steps to Native American. It's probably right between the first and the second by the design, yeah. Which would make it a little later in the quarter, first quarter. So we're gonna look at two pieces of Asian ceramic and remember we said that the uh, Chinese market had discovered the secret of porcelain. What is the secret of porcelain? Do you know it's why we call it bone china? There's a chemical in bone that they discovered in the earth which is kaolin, it's in bones as well as a mineral, or is it the same, John John, is it? it? I'm not sure. Okay. So when they discovered that kaolin could be heated to a certain degree, over 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, with a certain other combination of chemicals, porcelain was discovered, and it was discovered in China 8,000 years before we discovered it. Of course, many other things were too. And this is two examples of Chinese porcelain. They're both in a pattern called rose medallion, and rose medallion is a very famous style. It was done for the Chinese market, but it quickly caught on as being popular for the Victorian market. So you see Rose Medallion has that pink and has that green. And you'll notice that the, the little basket 
has a slot for the teacups and a slot for the pot. Well, this is because when you took your lunch with you, you took your teapot and you took your heated tea and the tea would be nice and hot when you got where you were going. Um, and so the little cups fit in there and then there's always a basket, such a thing as a basket to keep it all warm. Some of these sets are bigger than this that I've seen. Uh, this set is, is a little bit smaller set, but what makes this so nice is that it's all together. It's all one thing. Usually there's a, tea, a, a, a cup that's broken or a handle that's off, etc. But these are beautiful and in good shape. The value of this is 500 to 600. And then we see also a rose medallion plate. Now you look at this and you'll say, well, this is a little more refined looking. So this has a little more refinement than the, the teapot. The teapot is a heavier, coarser porcelain. So with the, the rose medallion plate that is uh, reticulated, that means it's got that piercing around the edge and rose medallion, see the reticulated place. In the style of rose medallion, it is rose medallion because rose medallion, the porcelain has a little bit of a blue tone to it. So the value of the plate is around 300. There are collectors for rose medallion. That's a particularly nice one. Let's do another piece of Asian porcelain. This is Nippon. Uh, Nippon or Noritake are uh, two separate uh, companies that were, that's a Japanese porcelain maker. And what is the style? Can you just abstract this and take a look at the line? What's the style? Grecian. Well, Grecian, but that classic style should indicate Art Deco to you, right? So it's got that Art Deco kind of cut to it. And that is in the Art Deco style. Um, now, this would have also been part of a mantle garniture. So you would have had this, you would have probably had some candlesticks with it, etc. This was a wedding present. The lady who brought it up said this was a wedding present to her grandmother. Yes, we are talking the, the 20s, the 1920s, the height of the Art Deco period starts in the 20s. And, um, you know, people say to me, but isn't Nippon the name for Japan? Remember we talked about pre-copyright. And so until the McKinley Tariff Act, there was, um, you, could, you, could tra you could send anything. It didn't have to be marked. So it's very helpful to know that if something is marked made in such and such, the date is after 1900, after the McKinley Tariff Act. Because made in such and such, it wasn't legislated until that time. So this is, you know, Nippon. Well, Nippon means J Japan, but it also means the factory. We couldn't do that today because it's got to be more specific. But at that time, you could do that. So Nippon meant a lot of different things. It also meant the factory. The value of that, it's in pretty good shape, and there are collectors for that. So I'm going to put that around 250 to 300 on that. It's called a bride's basket. So it's a bride's basket, and that's a classical style. What was this used for? Well, it could have been used for flowers, you know, but more importantly, what was the style bride's basket? What was it used for? So let's go back to 19 teens, 1920s, and let's say we're upper class uh, white girls in Boston. And let's say we're just engaged to somebody with four names and a junior after it, right? And let's say our girlfriends want to pay their respects and they want to wish us well and this sort of thing. Our butler puts the bride's basket in the hallway so that our girlfriends can put their calling cards in the bride's mm. basket and be, oh yeah, and then be announced, you know, Miss So-and-so, what's a nice white wasp name. Miss Carmichael is here to see, you know, something like this. And so, you know, you would be announced that the cards would be in the bride's basket. Now, there are bride's baskets and there are bride's baskets. This is E-P-N-S. What is that? Electro plate nickel silver. That doesn't mean it's sterling. It means it's silver plate. So, this is now, this is not um, this is not Miss Carmichael's bride's basket. Mm -hmm. This is Miss who shall it be? Maybe who, middle class. What's a good middle class Smith. name? Smith. 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 <laughs> nice middle class name. So it's a nice middle class bride's basket, electroplated nickel silver, silver plate in that style. 
Now silver plate, if you have children the way I do in the 30s, they're 30 year old, you know that they don't like silver plate. Why? It, it tarnishes. And what else? You can't put it in the... <laughs> we got half the room dishwasher, half the room microwave, both are correct. You know, so silver plate is not in right now. It's, a, it's very low on the market right now. The value of this is under $100 because of that. On here, this hand, here's sterling. I'm kind of representing sterling. Here's antique value, here's meltdown value. Sometimes it goes like this. And the market right here, right now, is about this. So there, it's kind of even. But that is actually, if you have Cartier, Tiffany, uh, some of the finer sterling, if you have a better pattern, Francis I, for example, that kind of pattern it will actually retain its value. But here again, it falls under that category of the 30-year-olds to the 40-year-olds. They don't want it. They don't entertain this way. So the value is very low for sterling. So we might see meltdown be higher than antique value soon. Hard to say. It's been my experience. That, you know, I have many clients over the 30-year period. And in the last 10 years, I have more clients call me and say, what the heck do I do with my grandmother's, mine, and my mother's sterling place settings? I mean, I've got three services, and what do I do with them? My kids don't want it. So we see the market very full. When the market's full, prices are low. Yeah. So let's look at the Kuan Yin. So, um, at, so let me tell you a little bit about Asian art. Asian art is very different from Western art. You know that already, because Asian art is what we call classic. When you study the history of art, there's two philosophies. Well, there's more than two, but just to show you, Western art is the history of genius. So it goes from Giotto to, let's say, Jeff Koons. You know, there's a history of genius. And each genius puts its own stamp on the history of art. In Chinese and Japanese and Korean art, this is not the case. Also African art, by the way, in some of the oceanic cultures. And I'll, I'll show you what I mean when I say in a 400-year period, there's 18 Hiroshigis. That's because the master Hiroshigi had a master style. He taught his apprentice, who was not a relative, his style, who taught another apprentice, who taught another apprentice. And the idea was to keep as close to the classic as possible. So it wasn't to reinvent from Giotto to Jeff Koons. It wasn't the idea to reinvent. It was the idea to remain consistent and classic. So, you know, how old is she? She could be Ming. She could be seventh century. She could be yesterday. And, you know, basically it's the composition of the material. You know, we, we think that she's probably not Ming. We think that she's probably 20th century. Also, her position, you know, Kuan Yin, she's got a, what we call contrapostal. Contrapostal is the S-curve, that style. We didn't discover contrapostal until Donatello. We didn't discover that until the Renaissance. So she is a beautiful, and Kuan Yin goes back 8,000 8, years. You know, this is an old, she is an old goddess, a protecting goddess. What happened in the uh, Second and First World War and also the Japo uh, Ch uh, Chinese War previous to the Se First World War? What happened is the country was so poor. And then remember I told you about the McKinley Tariff Act where things had to be marked. So people would be, you know, Chinese peasants and what noblemen would be on the streets hawking their wares, but they couldn't sell them unless they were new looking and were marked. So we do find these old Ming pieces that have been over plastered and marked again, you see, because they, they couldn't sell them unless they were made in those conditions. So in many cases, you know, uh, Via seeing the plaster being fairly new, I see that the work, the stance is very old and elegant. There's another thing with any kind of art, and this is hugely important, and that's somebody, uh, my, my mentor for many years uh, told me, and he said, look, Elizabeth, old things look old. And what that means is 
if you've got such an intricate piece like this and it was 7th century, the likelihood that there would be a repair somewhere, the likelihood that she'd be missing something somewhere. You know, you use your common sense and you think to yourself, well, is she old? Maybe she is, but the wear isn't there. Then there's also the exception. Maybe she's a museum piece and the wear was never there because she was curated correctly. So you run through all these things in your mind. I think looking at her, she's 20th century, late 19th, early 20th century, could be a little earlier, not sure. We'd have to really look at the chemical analysis of the, of the material, which is carved wood. I'm going to put, because of the elegance, I'm going to put her around two to 3,000. I think she's a beautiful piece. If she were older, I'd be higher, just because the condition is so fantastic. I was saying to John this morning, I was listening to the Mueller report, and I was saying, you know, this is... This report should be on the cover of Mad Magazine with the title saying, What Me Worry? And I come today, and this is what I find. How funny. So this is Me Worry, and Via is saying, Well, that's not the Mad Magazines. I remember it's Me Worry. But you see, was it Kranzberg, Kranzberg the, oh, the first founder of Mad Magazine? He actually developed this cartoon of Alfred E. Newman. I'm not sure where he got the face from, but there was somebody who decided it looked too much like him and sued. Oh. Can you imagine admitting this? <laughs> <laughs> so in any rate, there was a lot of controversy about the what me worry, but the first drawing was 1911. Wow. Yeah which is quite amazing that the Alfred E. Newman goes that, back that far. Yeah. Does anyone know more about Alfred than I do? You know, this is quite an old one. This is probably one of the, um, it, it is a lithograph. It's not an original drawing, but it is one of the old ones of what, what me, or what, why worry. We weren't able to find a value because, of course, it, it's a lithograph, but it is an old one, and it's in the old frame. It's funny, it's got the Sterling and Welsh framing company on the back from Cleveland, Ohio. You know this brings up the topic of the collector's market. If you put this on eBay in a general uh, market, it wouldn't be worth much. But if you took it to a Comic-Con convention and there were a million ma uh, Mad Magazine collectors, it'd be worth a heck of a lot of money. So it's to, it, you choose your market in many cases. And a lot of people don't understand that when they go to sell something. They say to me, well, I've got like a collection of Ronson lighters. I'm just going to give them more. No, pick the Ronson Lighters Club. <laughs> Sell them there. You see? So uh, what do you think, Via? What would you say value-wise? Somebody collects Mad Magazine? I think if somebody, I think if the right person saw this, I'd probably say 250 yeah. oh, I thought 500 I kind of want it. You want it? <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So the gentleman in the back, going once, yeah. going twice. Right. <laughs> People always ask me uh, when I do these to do a little bit of a, of, a, of a conversation. Everybody who knows me knows I'm a thrift store junkie and my outfit is from Unity Shop today and everything I have, it, well thank you. Well thank you, but you know, everything I buy is from thrift stores and people go, like, really your pearls? Yes, because I go into thrift stores and I grind them against my teeth and I find the real ones. Oh. <laughs> So people always ask me, how do you find a painting? How do you know it's a good it's painting? Good. How do you know? You know, nowadays we have the cell phone, we can look up the artist. But, you know, before you look up the artist, if there's a million people behind, uh, or a million people in front of the thrift store counter, and somebody's grabbing a painting, you just want to grab it because you know it's a good painting. So how do you tell if it's a good painting? Well, let me give you a couple hints how, how I've been trained and how it's worked for me. First of all, you look at what the artist intended. What's the artist's intention? The artist's intention here is to show reality as close to real, real as possible. You know, if before you study or have a doctorate in art history, you'd look at it and say, well, it's realism, right? It's a, it's a landscape. So it's realism. Realism is always, we, uh, we're trained in the Western way to see foreground, midground, background. So is his foreground right? Is his midground right? Is his background right? Yeah, kind of. Is his detail in the front telling enough about the detail to lead us into the painting? I would say no. I would say the detail's weaker. Now, here's the big clue. Here's what I do. Flip it upside down, Via. 
it, what I do when I'm looking at a painting is I always look at it upside down. And when I look at a painting upside down, what am I looking for? Well, think composition, exactly. Think of the, your favorite poem, right? Think right now of your favorite poem. Think about dropping one line out of that poem, just one line. It falls apart. So composition in art is always the same. Nothing should be taken away and nothing can be added. So composition is perfect no matter if you're looking at it. Okay, now you're going to say, I already saw it right side up and it's sort of like those Rorschach tests where your eyes are making the adjustment. So squint. Look at it and squint. See, can you read the composition? Look at it like you look at an abstract piece of art. What do you think? Does it work? I don't think it does. I don't think it's a strong enough composition. And when I say that, I'm thinking it's more programmatic as a work of art. It's more, um, what do you call it? Uh, it's what we would expect if someone said, it's predictable, it's predictable, which is great. You know, Corot is predictable. There's artists that are predictable. They've made a strength at being predictable. Well, to, to me, that's a good painting, but it's not a great painting. So would I grab it? I, pro I probably wouldn't, but you know, it is, it is not a bad painting. That's before I look up the artist and before I do anything as regards the celebrity of the artist. I look to see what I think of the composition. Another way you can do this, uh, let's see. Another way you can do this, if you, if you already have it in your mind that the, the landscape is the landscape. What you can do to fool yourself and test the composition is take one thing out of the composition. So we, I always carry like a little index card with me. And I, let's take one thing out. Is it a good painting still? Is it an average to good painting still? Yeah, it's okay. It makes sense. It's a, it needs some focus, but there's the focal point. You know, it's okay. I mean, this doesn't add a whole heck of a lot. So I experiment with that and I say, now, the composition is the artist's tour de force. I mean, it's abstract. It's not the representation. It's the composition that makes the painting. Why? Because it's two dimensions. Painting is two dimensions, period. And it's the artist's strength in composition. So um, if you said to me, well, what's the value before you look up the artist? I would say the value is around 1,000 to 2,000 on the painting. I think if it was a great painting, you know, we'd be up there. We'd be 5,000, 10,000, et cetera, for a landscape. I will tell you also landscapes right now are not popular. Uh, you know, it's, they're a hard sell. Oh, this is Steinberg, the great cartoonist from the New Yorker. Wasn't it New Yorker? Yep. And uh, what is it? What is a train station of, oh, French, a French mm -hmm. Gare du Nord yeah. or something? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great piece. Fantastic. We, uh, Via and I agree that it is original. It's a pen and ink. I asked Via if she could look to see if it's a maquette or prototype. What is a maquette or prototype? Did uh, Steinberg make that drawing for the cover of The New Yorker? If so, we got double value. You see what I'm saying? Is it just a, a piece that he liked to do? Is it something that The New Yorker paid him, a commission piece? And then, how many uh, editions of that one New Yorker did sold? If it was a blockbuster cover, you know, like a Rockwell was, for example, for Saturday Evening Post, it was a blockbuster cover, it is triple value, you see. So Via was around the 2000, I'm a little more than that. I think it's a great piece. Uh, we couldn't find if it was a cover or not, but we only had a few minutes to look. That would be a real good exercise to do. Um, but I'm around the 2000 on that. You know what is the coolest thing? Midge. Midge. Midge is here. Look at Midge. We f here is Midge. She's the ugliest of all the Barbies, my absolute favorite. You know, here's Midge. She was the scamp, the little sister everybody loved to hate, you know. Yeah, you forgot about Midge? Skipper. Oh, there's Skipper's here too. Okay, here's Skipper. Here's Skipper, there's Skipper. And look at Ken.
Yeah, yeah. This so this is Malibu Ken. Anyway, so what's the history of Barbie? Well, Barbie was invented by a female. She was premiered in California. I happen to know her great niece. I did an appraisal for her for original Barbies. She remembers her great aunt putting the original Barbie prototype at a dinner party and seeing how the company reacted. And I actually appraised one of those original Barbies. We had a chance then to go with her to Mattel and uh, and show them her collection, et cetera, of Barbies. Uh, you know, Barbies, the, here's the thing. Any toys, any books, anything associated with children's anything. Condition, condition, condition. You've got some wonderful clothes in there, but the condition is important because there are collectors that want the original Barbies, the original condition, the original clothes. What do you think? Five to eight? Together? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so, so we're in agreement. So five to eight hundred together for, you know, for, for all the gear. And um, it's just, it's wonderful. It's iconic. It's symbolic. <laughs> it's everything material culture should be. It's based in consumerism. It's based in uh, sexism. It's everything material culture. <laughs> Anybody know what this is? Nutcracker? Yes, that's a nutcracker. Oh. And it's a German nutcracker, German carved nutcracker. And, you know, um, I, I have to say, so my background is German. And there's a certain look to German things, which is borders on the grotesque. <laughs> you know, it's Heramisch Bosch kind of look to these things. And it's like, this will scare you. And if you've ever done LSD, you don't want to see oh, such a thing. But Never. No. And so the it's a German nutcracker, and it's a beautiful piece. And uh, we also see the, these forms with Meerschaum pipes, you know, the kind of grotesquerie, these forms. It, 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 very peculiar to the German sensibility pre-World War I. There's certain things that indicate a certain cultural mentality and a certain cultural philosophy. That nutcracker is actually one of them. People do collect those. You know, the value is probably around $75 on that. What, what are we looking for when we look at jewelry? And um, Well, first of all, with costume jewelry, you know, we're looking for exquisite workmanship. We're looking for names. You know, we're looking for some high-end names. We look for Chanel, we look for Schiaparelli, we look for um, uh, Raphael, Monet. We look for some of the makers of the, of the costume jewelry. What is that, the Denali? What is the festival when all the women get very dolled up in India and this sort of thing? So it's in the, the style of gold. It's very pretty, but it's um, Indian jewelry, that you know, kind of tourist custom Indian jewelry. Um, not any particular metal, but very cool. Mm. I just found a whole big, like, basket of this stuff in a thrift store in Bakersfield. Oh my yeah, so you never know where you're going to find stuff. Um, you know, this, uh, 25 bucks on that. Um, two pieces, ah, two pieces of costume, nicely made. We always look at the costume. Nicely made paste, nicely made. Uh, also n a nice... Hollycroft. So that's a, that's a middle level maker of costume. And this is not stamped, but I really like that. And I like the fact it's like a little, what do they call it? Little sure. choker thing. So uh, 1950s, 1940s, you know, the different eras. Um, I'm going to say uh, 60 bucks on this. I'm going to say 40 on that. The question is, when I look for pearls at thrift stores, so my big score was this one because these are eight millimeter. And um, what, so your teeth, your teeth have little tiny, I don't know, rims, grooves, and so do pearls. So if you take a pearl this direction, I'm going left to right. yeah, against your tooth, you'll feel gritty. Mm. You'll feel the grit answering the grit. If it's um, coated, you won't feel that. You'll feel smooth. You'll feel that the fake pearl mm. is smooth. There's 12 of these, right? What are they? Well, this is a little demi toss spoon. This is a little sugar tong. Can you imagine? Set a 12 for your service. People at 4 o'clock used to have cake and demi toss and tea. And especially if you're from a European family, everything would shut down in my grandmother's house. We'd have it. But I mean, this is, again, it's a certain period where you had extra stuff. You had 
sugar tongs, you had pickle forks, you had cucumber bowls. I mean, you had all this extra stuff. And nobody could run a household without that, right? So you had to have your sugar tongs. I mean, you know, now, oh, by the way, when was the cube invented? When was the sugar cube? Otherwise, you don't need a sugar tong. Right, right. I'm trying to find sugar cubes today, though. Oh, she said you can't find sugar cubes today. Oh, first of all, these are 800 silver. How do we know? B and I agree on this because you can't bend them the same way you can bend 925 over a thousand parts. 925 silver <coughs> over a thousand parts is sterling. 800 over a thousand is not sterling, but it is silver. So this is silver, but it's 800 silver. Usually that's continental, usually. We didn't have a lot of 800 in this country, and it looks to be continental. It's in the Renaissance Revival style. You know, so that puts it 1870 to 1880, the style itself. And because it's 800 silver set at 12, 12 times. Replacement? Yeah. Sure. Let's be uh, 800 to 1,000 on a set of 12, 800 silver. It's, I would be higher, but there's not a lot of market for sugar tongs. <laughs> What about German silver? German silver is 800 as well. Okay. So German silver and coin silver is usually at 800. Sometimes German silver goes as low as 750 over 1,000, but it's part silver over base metal. That's what that fraction means. Hey, Curtis, great uh, ethno photographer, turn of the century. Are they the real thing? Right. Okay, so he worked in a certain format. You know, we have silver gelatin, we have. Um, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, the photo? No, no. The, these are um, platinum prints. Platinum Thank radium. you. So, so we've got platinum prints, and you know, John, John, do you want to say anything about that? Uh, do you want to say anything about that? I really don't have enough. No. Okay. Sorry. Well, John can do platinum printing. I was hoping he'd tell you how difficult it was, etc. So, a uh, platinum printing is characterized by the depth of the tone of black or brown or sepia, it's, it, it's a deep tonal contrast. And the minute you see that, it's a sign of expert printing. Curtis, you know, I mean, the best of the best. You know, people buy his portfolios. Uh, portfolio collection can be thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. can be up to five, too. Yeah, so we're talking, you know, five to eight. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we're talking five, <laughs> five to eight on those, you know, no, five to eight thousand. Yeah, 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 yeah. not, not hundred, no, five to eight thousand. And then we have these, you know, prints on paper. We have them pressed into the paper itself. So you can see the indenture of the paper. So it's a, it's a, they're pressed into the paper like an engraving would be pressed into the paper. We have one final thing and uh, that is a Roman, uh, one, oh, sorry, sorry, it's a Greek, Greek. classic. Uh, it's a little medallion. It is puzzling. And I thought I would discuss with you, Viha and myself, trying to figure out what exactly it was. Because when you look at an object, the first thing you say is, what was it? What was it used for? What does it mean? What is it, what is, where does it fit into the culture? So if you look at that piece, it's a relief mask. Relief is, okay, so if you're looking at me sideways, this, if you cut me in half, would be a relief. Relief is half. So it's a relief. It's a positive relief. There can be negative relief as if you're pressing something. It's a positive relief. It is in that terracotta material. So it's clay of some kind. And the back is what's puzzling because it has a little nib. A little notch. little notch on the back. Now, button. no, because it's not pierced. And there's no opening on that notch. I mean, she was saying, is it a button? Well, no, because there's no attachment to it. So where my mind was going, is it part of something? So in other words, is it part of something where that notch would center it into a, an opening of some kind? What was it? Then Viha called her professor of classics at Vanderbilt and said, look, we have this. She sent him a picture. And he said he thought it was some kind of a press medallion. In other words, 
When you have a pot and you want to sign the pot, you would use it as a hallmark of some kind. And that would mean you'd have to have something on the back so it would actually have that play. Well, then I thought to myself, what is it? So who is it? Well, it's a mask. And it's a mask of, of a Dionysian mask, all right? So it's Greek. So we won't say Bacchus, we'll say Dionysus, but that's a Greek word. The god of tragedy, the tragedy mask, right? So his theater mask, etc. So that was a popular subject for any kind of coinage. So I said to Viha, look and see if you can find, a, uh, if, well, it would be 4th, 5th century uh, BC coinage, Bacchus coinage, etc. We couldn't find it, but then again, we need a couple of days to do that. So if it was a mold for a coin, I said to Viha, look at the genius I am, I said, here is it's a mold for a coin. It has got to be the lost wax technique because the lost wax technique, it's got to be positive to negative and positive again. So it's got to be the mold, the cast, and then the cr creation. Yes, it could be a bronze coin, but it would have to be lost wax technique. If it was free cast, in other words, poured, it wouldn't have worked because a coin is not negative relief. A coin is positive relief. So jury's out. We don't know. We're getting close, but we need a little more time to figure out what exactly it was. Was it a cast? for? We know it was a cast for something. The relief is too deep to be just for the sake of being a relief. So what was it a relief for? So we, we can look a little further. Also, um, I want to close by telling you a little story that um, it has to do with the philosophy of, of material culture. Like I said, I'm a scholar of material culture. People ask me, what is that? It's culture in material form. So I look for what is behind the object. And I thought this story would be really amusing to close today. Um, the religious scholars amongst us will recognize the name of the great Jewish theologian Martin Buber. Mm -hmm. At, years ago, he told his fellow colleague, Heinrich Zimmer, who was a great Hindu scholar of the early 20th century, a famous joke about a material treasure. Rabbi Isaac Jekyll, who was a servant of the Lord for 50 years in the Krakow ghetto, had a portentous dream one night. His dream told him to go to the Bohemian capital of Prague, where if he dug, he would find treasure beneath the great bridge that led over to the castle of the Bohemian king. You know, he ignored the dream until he had it three times in a row. <laughs> so he journeyed far to Prague and loitered around that kingly bridge, and yet he feared those uniformed sentries who towered above him and watched him as he studied that bridge structure. So the most grand of all the guards, the captain, on the fourth day marched over to him and asked, if the old rabbi had lost something. Well, the rabbi trusted that the captain was a nice man, and he said, let me tell you my dream. And he told the dream to the officer, and the officer laughed at him, laughed in his face. And he said, my poor fellow, through his impressive mustache, he said, who would travel to the end of the earth on the strength of such a dream? I myself, I myself, if I trusted a dream, I should at this very minute be doing just the opposite of what you're doing. Because I dreamt of a voice which spoke to me of a village in Krakow telling me to search for treasure in the house of a rabbi whose name is Isaac of Jekyll. <laughs> the treasure was to be found, said the captain in the back of Rabbi Isaac Jekyll's stove. <laughs> and it would be in the hovel of a broken down little shack. But do you see me going to Krakow? Do you see me going where any bearded man might be such a rabbi? 
how could anybody like me ever find Isaac? Okay. <laughs> the little rabbi looks up, says, bye. <laughs> bows deeply to the captain as he leaves the area of the bridge and abruptly heads for his little hovel in Krakow. <laughs> All right. Now, in the corner behind the stove, he found a great treasure. And with the great treasure, he founded a temple which bears his name today in Krakow. Now that's the story, but here's my analysis for you today. The treasure we discover is never far from our homes, sheltered by the light and the warmth of our homes, but we only discover this after we look far and wide for treasures that in the last analysis mean very little to us. Those kinds, the little, the things that don't matter that much, those kinds are easy to find and you'll know them because we don't have to dig deep to find them. And they have little meaning in the long run. And you'll be surprised to hear it from me because for 30 years I've told people what things are worth. I am the original poster child for the material girl. However, <laughs> the real worth in material things that occupy our lives is found in a relationship to that treasure. My hope today is that I showed you a value beyond the cost of your objects, and I helped that object to speak to you about the meaning and connectedness in your life that objects often symbolize. Remember that objects in the last run stand for a relationship, and that's when they are valuable. And this unique relationship may signal your own personal relationship to beauty, to a special person, to your family, or to a time and place. And I thank you very much for allowing me to be part. Oh, that was